Featuring Jackie Vadesta Batanda from uh, Uganda and Aman Seti from India, facilitated by Ndumi Songobo. I'd like to invite them onto the stage, please, if you could give them a round of applause. Uh, yeah, my name is uh, Ndumi Songobo. Uh, I, I spend my life. Um, writing things, mostly because I'm, 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 I'm a bit I'm too lazy to actually do a, a real job. Um, yeah, that's what, that's, what, that's, what, that's, what, that's what we do. And I'm going to dazzle you with, uh, with my reading skills, um, which is um, what, you know, what it is that we do. I always feel a bit silly when I introduce uh, you know, people when, when there's, there's a, a, a program. Um, I'll start uh, with a man, only because you know, his name starts with an A. For no other reason. Um, a man, uh, Sethi born in, uh, in India, um, studied chemistry, uh, of, all, of all things. Uh, one is a, a, a BSc, um, which he uh, confidently tells me is, uh, is what, uh, what people do uh, when they do not quite know what it is that they want to do with their lives. And I, uh, as someone who, who once came here before I was unceremoniously um, kicked out. Uh, I also studied a PhD. Yeah, um, I just did, I just didn't finish, unlike you. Uh, and he um, then also went into journalism. A very interesting story about how he got uh, uh, into journalism. Um, it is in your program, uh, but then he's got this this book, um, A Free Man, published uh, two years ago. Uh, based on the lives of, uh, of a group of Delhi Witch laborers uh, who sleep uh, uh, in Delhi's pavements. Uh, and, um, but yeah, he, um, he works uh, in the field of journalism, uh, but he'll tell you a bit more about uh, himself through the discussion that we are about to have. And uh, also uh, on, the, on the panel, we've got Jackie. Uh, and uh, of course, Jackie hails from Uganda, even though she is based uh, here in, uh, in Johannesburg in South Africa uh, these days. Uh, journalist, writer, um, and writing fellow at uh, the African Center for Migration and Society at, the, at, the, at VETS uh, Univer University. Uh, uh, has a PhD degree uh, in, uh, Margar from Margarita University in uh, Kampala. Uh, and has written numerous short stories, uh, and uh, uh, a lot of it steeped in uh, in the realms of, of fiction, um, anthologies, including uh, the thing that ate your brain, holding on to memories, uh, and Adora's turn, uh, among others. And I, 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 I'm particularly interested uh, in mentioning Adora's turn because um, when we start this out. Uh, I'm going to be asking them to read, just for you to get a sense of what it is that they write. Um, now, Jackie, um, Jackie, um, <laughs> you would like to read something from Dora's turn. Um, any particular re reasons? Why that one? Yes. Um, thank you, Aman. You see, Uganda and India, we are just working it out. For those of you who are here, opening, you know, you know that history. So we are working it out. You know how it is with these relationships. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes I throw you out of my house, sometimes you throw me out of your house. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, this is lovely. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, Dumi, so that's a very good question why I would like to read yeah. Dora's Tan, which, by the way, is a very short story. I think it's less than 600 words. Um, as we spoke earlier, I told you that I first got into fiction writing before I got into yes. journalism. And um, in the early 2000s, we had this conflict taking place in the northern part of Uganda. And for most of us that lived in the um, 
for most of us that lived in the capital because the conflict was in the northern part of the country. At one time, it seemed like there were two countries in Uganda, and so the one half, you know, was um, terribly ravaged by war, and then the other half life was going on, and we would read about, you know, the conflict taking place in the newspapers, and it's like, oh my goodness, that is so sad, you know, like how someone in New York will read about the, you know, you know, it's about an armed conflict in any part of the world. That is how disembodied we were from the whole experience, you know, we were all just like, oh, Oh my God, this is so sad. So poor people. And after I read a lot and a lot of the reportage, I was, um, I found I was moved or compelled to put that in fiction. And so Dora's turn is among the different short stories that I wrote for a long time about the conflict in northern Uganda because I thought it is important for us like as Ugandans you know within the country to contribute our narratives and document what is taking place so um, so Dora Stan was one of those stories I wrote and it's also one of the you know and um, because of doing this writing about the war is what motivated me to, to come down to University of Witwatersrand to do my master's in post-migration like that is the official story that I told people But the real story is Oxford didn't have the taxi to admit me <laughs> So I say that is their loss <laughs> Yeah <laughs> Yeah, so I'm going to get right into the um, Well, I'll just give a short um, Preamble of the piece and um, it says war, war is always in any place at any time a terrible thing the heart cries out against the killing, but it still happens. Somewhere in Uganda, Dora and her friend Achayo, who tells this story, are fighting in a war. They carry big AK-47 guns, and they know all about death and killing, pain and fear. They are children. They are 12 years old. One of the things about the conflict in the north was at one time we had, you know, um, the number of child soldiers that had been abducted was over 20,000. You know, so like the army at one time was just made up of child soldiers, 20,000 strong, and so these some some of them were as young as eight, you know, or nine. I want to make it clear that the conflict is over, there was a peace process which which took place, and right now there is the reconciliation phase. But Joseph Kony, who we now refer to as a mercenary because he's now based in the Central African Re Re Republic and is per perpetrating the same crimes, but why I read this now is because we still need to have these conversations taking place. Yeah. The little boy's cries are getting quieter, weaker. I can only hear the words, please, please, no, no, help, help. Now there is a louder voice, the voice of Mad Tiger, our commander. He is 14 years old. Hit him harder, he shouts at us. Get closer to him, use your whips harder. The noise of our whips through the air is louder than the boy's cries. Our war is good, shouts Mad Tiger. We must clean out bad people. We are soldiers. No escaping, no running away. Everyone must fight. The other commanders smoke their cigarettes under a tree. Go on, they laugh at us. Get blood on your hands. The boy on the ground stops moving. Our whips are still. It is over. I feel ill. There is something hard in my throat like a stone. I can't breathe. My friend Dora also tried to escape and she reneged. They will order me to kill her. Dora and I have been close. We are both 12 years old. Dora, who is going to be a doctor after the war. Dora, who wants to save lives, to stop the killing. Dora, who has been my friend when I awake in the night, screaming because I can see the faces of all the people that I have killed. The AK-47 is heavy on my shoulder and I stand. Waiting, waiting for Dora's turn. And the stone in my throat gets bigger. A child, my tiger shouts. I turn and look at him, hiding the fear in my eyes. It is a crime to show fear. My mouth is shut in a hard line. This helps to stop the tears coming into my eyes. Yes, Afande, I say quietly. My voice must not be angry or unhappy or afraid, just quiet. That way, he will not hear my fear. I give a soldier salute to my commander. Take my gun off my shoulder. 
and hold it up against my body. The gun points up to the black sky and the full moon. The moon looks down at us, watching these deaths. Mad Tiger smiles, his teeth shining white in the moonlight. He looks pleased. Are you ready? I cannot speak, but I nod my head. They push Dora forward and she falls on the ground in front of me, trembling. She is so small and thin like a flower shaking in the wind. Our eyes meet. We cannot use words, so we speak with our eyes. I don't want to do this, my eyes tell her. But Mad Tiger and the other commanders are watching us. So I take Dora's arm and pull her to her feet. I want to ask her questions. Why did she try to escape without me? Why, Dora? Why? We have always known each other's secrets before tonight. Holding Dora's arm, I push her towards the trees. The killing will happen there, behind the trees, where no one can see. They are watching me. I can feel their eyes on my back. Perhaps they are following us, but I can't turn around to look. My legs are trembling. The stone in my throat gets bigger. My hands are hot and wet, and my fingers are making marks on Dora's arm. I take my hand away. I can't do this, not to Dora. We have been here together for three years. Don't be sorry, Dora whispers. You have to do it. Everybody has to do it. She mustn't talk. Someone will hear, afraid. I look behind me. We are alone. Quickly, I push Dora further into the tree to stop. I'm cold. I'm afraid. I can't do this, I cry. You must, Dora whispers, or they'll kill you too. Then they must kill us both. The stone in my throat goes away with those words. You are my friend. We can run away. Look for the government soldiers. Ask for help, I speak excitedly. We can do it. A child, Dora says. Stop this talk. You know we? At that moment comes the sound of heavy guns behind us, where my tiger and the others are. What, whispers Dora. Suddenly, I understand. Those are government army guns, not our guns. A helicopter gunship has found Mad Tiger's group. This is our chance. I drop my gun and take hold of Dora's hand. Run! Dora stares at me, not sure. Do you still want to be a doctor? I shout. Suddenly, Dora's feet come to life again, and the ground under our running feet trembles. As, as much as you proclaim that uh, you are in love uh, with each other, um, <laughs> <I'm> a, <laughs> a man, uh, no pressure. But just t tell me, um, why that particular part uh, in a Freeman? I'm actually fascinated. Uh, I have no idea which part you're going to read, uh, but, but, but why? Just, uh, well, you know, well? I, I just think that, uh, that this particular part of the book uh, I think it pulls together a, a lot of things um, because it's, I think it's fairly representative uh, as, as, as you know the book is about people who live on the streets, it's, it's non-fiction and it's based on five years of research and um, I think that this is something that will give uh, the audience a sense of all the intersecting forces that, that operate on someone who lives on the street. So I think the passage is, is fairly self-explanatory. Uh, if it isn't, of course, there's, there's always questions, so we can, we can discuss it then. So I'll just, I think I'll just start without any further preamble. You can tell by looking at the hands. The rickshaw pullers, for example, have rough calluses here. Sharmaji grabs my hand and points to the arc where the fingers join my palm. It is the rickshaw's hard plastic handles. The skin first blisters, and then the blisters become calluses, and then the calluses form small little ridges. They also have big bulging calves, Sharmaji adds as an afterthought, and some of them sit funny. Mazdoor hands, a mazdoor is a laborer, are different from beggar hands. They have calluses too, but their nails are scuffed from pulling, from handling bricks and sand. You won't see a rickshaw puller with scuffed hands. Painters tend to be tall and lanky and are usually sprinkled with paint dust. Carpenters are Muslims and usually carry tools. Never, Aman sir. Never trust a man who travels without his tools. Sharmaji, raiding officer for the Department of Social Welfare and the source of these ethnographic insights, has rather soft hands himself, the sort that might be subjected to the occasional massage of pond school cream. But he has strong fingers and well-rounded shoulders, the anatomy of a man used to grabbing people and shaking them about. Beggars don't have calluses. How can they if they never work? Also, a working man, no matter how poor he is, 
will always look you in the eye when he talks to you. But beggars? Beggars can't look me in the eye. Now take you for instance. He shakes my hand vigorously, somehow managing to point with me with my own fingers. No one would mistake you for a beggar even if you dress up as one. I try and imagine if I would look Sharmaji in the eye. He reminds me of a particularly feared mathematics teacher from school, a man who appeared reasonable at most, most times, but could be moved to violence by completely innocuous acts. My teacher too had a habit of grabbing students by the shoulder and jerking them about, an experience I found intensely disorienting. This should be a frenetic period of activity for Sharmaji and his team. The minister heading his department has promised to make Delhi beggar free in time for the Commonwealth Games in 2010. Sharmaji's department has deadlines to meet, beggars to deport, and cases to file. The target for the year is at least 5,000 beggars, but the reception room is empty, save for the two of us and a few small courtrooms. Sharmaji's raid vehicle has broken down, making it impossible for him to drive around the city chasing beggars. The wheels of the Delhi government do not move any faster for its own departments, and so Sharmaji has been told that a new vehicle will arrive in some time. Right now, the only beggars we have are those that have been rounded up by the Delhi police. But they don't know how to read hands. The police can't tell a beggar from a labourer. Suddenly, I am very afraid for my friends. The police don't even know how to catch them. Sharmaji is disconsolate. There is a special technique. You can't just stop anywhere and run at them. Now, where would you go to catch a beggar? I don't know. A traffic light? Wrong, he says with some satisfaction. Correct, but wrong. Don't worry, it is a logical mistake to make. You may find them at a traffic light, but you cannot catch them at a traffic light. <laughs> you see the difference? We all know that beggars stand at traffic lights, but if you try and catch them, they often run off straight into the traffic. The result, accidents, traffic jams, and then the public also gets upset. Instead, Sharmaji and his friends take out the major temples in the city. It is the fault of our culture. If people spend rupees in feeding beggars, why would anyone work? All they do is sit and wait for them to be fed. This is not how you give discipline to the nation. At temples, beggars tend to be more docile and less likely to escape through rush hour traffic. Temples, train stations, bus stands. Here you will not only find beggars, but will also be able to arrest them. It is best to arrive after they have been fed, mid-afternoon to late evening, when they are drowsy and there aren't too many pilgrims around. Unsurprisingly, Sharmaji also has a photographic memory. I never forget faces. Never. I will never forget your face. It is stored in my brain's computer. Since the Begging Act, Act prescribes not less than one year and not exceeding three years for first-time offenders and ten years for repeat offenders, raiding officers like Sharmaji are often asked to testify if they have ever arrested the same person before. Obviously, no one gives the same name twice. So we have registers and registers of the same people, only stored under different names and addresses. Most departments which have, would have buckled under the weight of such voluminous and apparently useless data, but not the Department of Social Welfare, which has already begun to computerize its registers. Equipped with the latest advances in biometric technology, the Beggar Information System, or BIS 2.1, is like our own little passport office. The machine is designed to store the details of every single person arrested by Sharmaji's team. Name, date of birth, place of birth, photograph, and biometric fingerprint. Once registered, the information is stored forever, implying that recidivists will no longer fool the judge by claiming they just got off a train in Delhi, were robbed off all their possessions, and were begging to get enough money to go back home. Once arrested, the beggars are marched off to the registration room, photographed, fingerprinted, and presented before the court. If convicted, they are taken to one of 12 prisons set aside for beggars and locked up for a minimum of one year and a maximum of three. So can I see the system? I am eager to witness the information revolution at work. Where is the machine stored? On the first floor. Sharmaji is unsure. It isn't really working these days. We've called the technician, but after a point, he stopped taking our calls. Occasionally, the receptionist, who is on his lunch break, calls the technician from a different phone number from another department. But the technician has wised up to these tricks. <laughs> he says some part is missing, and he shall only come when it arrives from the warehouse. I just want to see it. We don't need to use it or anything. Come along then. 
Sharma ji turns a key and there it is, under a shroud of plastic dust covers, the beggar information system version 2.1. It is a record of every beggar with the misfortune of crossing Sharma ji and his team. The machine is a rather bland looking personal computer, with little to distinguish it apart from a rather clunky webcam and what appears to be a small plastic matchbox. Is this it? I find it hard to conceal my disappointment. Well, yes. To be honest, we were surprised ourselves. We expected something a lot bigger. So this is the biometric reader. I pick up the box and toss it in my hands casually. Careful, Aman sir, careful. This is not a toy. This is a biometric device. The beggars place their thumbprint on the glass. The webcam takes their photograph. And that way we have full identification. So is the database searchable? There are a few problems. Sharma ji says sheepishly as he fires up the machine. The designers had failed to read the tender document carefully. The tender, freely available on the internet, clearly asks for an interface to identify the habitual beggars at the time of reception by scanning the thumb impression or keying in other relevant information to establish identity. But this crucial detail had slipped the designer's mind. Instead, the firm, whose name Sharma ji coyly refused to reveal, you are from the press, no, hee <laughs> hee, had provided two separate interfaces, one for data entry and one for data search thereby doubling the time required for registration instead of halving it. This was the particular software error that the technician had appeared unable to fix until the missing part arrived. The other more pressing problem lies with the scanner itself. Though the, mandate, though the tender had mandated a scratch resistant scanning surface, the scanner, as befitting any high-tech gadget, was extraordinarily sensitive to dust. It worked best when recording images of clean, slightly moist thumbs that when pressed down onto the glass surface flattened ever so slightly to allow for a true record of the fingerprint in question. But these beggars. The exasperation in Sharma ji's voice is palpable. Their hands are so dirty, so filthy, that the scanner just cannot pick up the image. All they got were blurry smudges that the machine was unable to identify, let alone catalog and search. So we started washing their hands before registering them. But that took too long. The department also tried bathing them, but after a bath, the beggars looked just like anyone else. <laughs> so how then can the judge make his decision? Now we register them manually before the hearing, and then again on the computer in the evening. That way we have complete records. But you can't search them. We can. Sharma ji is quick to defend BIS 2.1. It just takes some time, that's all. In India, all everyone wants to do is criticize. As I get up to leave, Sharmaji points to three freshly bathed men leaving the reception center. <laughs> the judge gave them a second chance, he says. I catch up with one of them on the way out. Are you a beggar? Of course not. I am a snake charmer. <laughs> so where is your snake? Sharmaji asked me the same question. The wildlife department took it away. <laughs> I think I speak for everyone when I say uh, we sure are glad uh, you didn't uh, follow chemistry. I mean, you would have, you, you would have been wasted uh, figuring out the molar mass of hydrogen disulfide or <laughs> some such. You um, can't have hydrogen disulfide. I know. <laughs> um, now, here's, you know, here's, a, here's a question. Well, I'm always fascinated um, when, when uh, I come to these literary festivals uh, and how it is that the organizers decide on panels and exactly what it is that, that has to be uh, discussed. Um, I have to ask you this, this question, just starting with you, Jackie. Um, when you first heard um, the reporter as, as the writer, there are people such as myself who, um, the only reason we write um, is that the story itself that I write is an end unto itself. Uh, and then I try later on, uh, retrospectively, to try and find out, is there a point I could make, possibly, about what I've just written? But really, it's really, uh, it's just self-gratification. I just want to tell the story. When you write um, um, as, a, as a reporter, um, a, a, as someone who's written both fiction, who's also reported, for you, why do you, why do you write? You write for the story itself? Or is there an end um, um, 
to like, do you start out with the end in mind, or do you, or is it really just for you the story it, uh, itself? Your journey. Um, writing for me, you know, like we we talked earlier when when we had this discussion, and the two of you didn't know you would be writers and all of that. Yeah. I knew I was going to be a writer. Like I said earlier, I knew I was going to be a writer, have published over six novels by the time I was 30. You know, <laughs> like um, the whole here would be completely full and everything, but I woke up from that dream. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, because um, uh, I grew up in a home where we had many group books in the house so I used to read a lot and then my elder siblings loved telling stories. They would read the different novels like Jeffrey Archer and coming from Uganda where we had power outages, you know, just you Uganda has had very many conflicts and all of that, you know, so just coming out of a post conflict situation and the electricity is unstable. Um you know, so in the evening we'd sit outside and they would regale me with all these different stories. And I really wanted to also like write and capture words and create different words. And I keep telling people like, when I write, you know, I write because I want to play God. You know, you can create characters and kill them and you know, make them fall in love. And, you know, like all the different things that might be difficult to happen in real life. So for, yeah. for me, that was the thing about, you know, like, that was the thing that drew me to writing, to create beautiful worlds, you know, just living inside in my head. And like I said earlier, I never really, yes, I did think for journalism, but the first love was fiction. Then when I started writing fiction and writing a lot more about the conflict in the northern part of Uganda, then I was like, okay, yes, you won the BBC award. And then you're telling yourself it's good to have this story out, but honestly, I was the one who was benefiting. I was the one, like you know, you get an award, you get money, and you go and have fun, right? But you know, the situation is still the same. So I was curious to know more about displacement. So that is when we had that issue with Oxford, and then this taking me on and all of that. And so when I did the MA in post migration studies, it expanded my context, and then I wanted now, you know, and so I found that, you know, there are certain stories which you cannot put in fiction, like you want them, you know, it's like, they are real. Um, you hear something and you feel like this story must get out. So I got into what I refer to, you know, as journalism that is more focused towards social justice and human rights. So that is where the push came. And I like to move between the two of, of Oh, of course it's difficult, but the, the good thing about being both a reporter and then a writer, either fiction or non-fiction, you, you know, is like, there's certain stories that will come out better, like as an article, and you know, it's, this must come out and you tell it and probably you'll follow it up. I mean, like, um, one of the articles I wrote, um, a, couple of years back, I think like two years back, was was about this family from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, well, we all know about the um, conflict in the DRC, and it, it was a family of unaccompanied minors. So their parents had been killed, and they fled the D DRC to come to Uganda. They came walking. And the amazing thing is like the eldest girl, I think, at the time they fled was 16 years old. So on, on the process of their flight, they found a baby like the mother had been killed and the baby was still suckling at the breast and these children grabbed the baby and came with the baby to Uganda well of course it, you know it's like these are children them, themselves and they are also like you know it's they they also find this this child you know like the children are becoming parents you know and so it the, the time I met them they were in the process of their resettlement you know it had been a difficult life and everything and then after I wrote the article and then a couple of months later they were resettled to the United States of America for me that was a very happy story you know like you know those kind of things that follow up but that particular one I think worked well 
other features articles yeah and then there are those now like this this excerpt i just read sorry this short story which i just read dora's child for a long time we were bombarded with the atrocities you know of the conflict in the north you know and like I said earlier, we were disconnected and people were now like, oh, we are, we are tired. Can't those people are killing each other? Let them get over it, you know? And so it was important to now, like, bring fiction into the picture, you know, so that at times when, you know, it's people, well, I would say, like, there was partied among Ugandans in regards to the conflict with Portage in the north, you know, but, but now when you get it in a piece of fiction because there was yeah. visual work, coming out in that form and it really works because this like helps to highlight the issue of the child soldiers you know because we look at the yeah. issue of a 12 year old and they have a gun and they have killed people so you know like it works you know so i flip from one side to another because i find like one particular context you know you need to have it yeah. out in so you you basically choose um the, the best medium for yes. for the particular story um no i'm on the thing about it is, um, you had a, you had <laughs> Jackie talks about um, social justice and, and and human rights in the same sentence, um, almost as a, you 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 make a you make a distinction between those, and it, it speaks to exactly the same question that I was asking her about why it is that you feel the need uh, to write and the type of writing um, that you do. Um, that there's a distinction between. What you think sometimes are are justice issues that somehow morph into? Please um, just uh, speak a bit, a bit, a bit more. And you, you had a you have a very interesting example of, uh, of exactly justice. So, yeah. so um, no, essentially, I, so one of the one of the things that that I think the book allows you to do, which uh, uh, a news report, which, which is what I do on a daily basis, doesn't allow you to do, is to it's to kind of gesture towards a, and just not just gesture, but to try and flesh out an idea of a, of a, of a, of a, of a, well, of a problem that's been bugging me for some time, and and I think that that, I, that I've been thinking about for a long time, particularly in the context of India, and I I would be interested to see how in the question answer session it plays out here, is this 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 whole question of human rights, and and given that this is on on South Africa's human rights day, I mean I just think that human rights is a bunch of bullshit, and. My, but, 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 my, and, but my analysis of that is that, that what human rights seems to be is that human rights seems to be this kind of strange cupboard of, of various kind of you know, rights which, which if you actually pull them out apart are far more effective when you actually write about them one by one. So, so the sphere of human rights tend to, tends to absolutely consume uh, the sphere of just good old justice. So, so if you look, for example, at what happens with the with the rights-based discourse is that the rights-based discourse essentially becomes like this profoundly legal question, and then it becomes a question that that all these people who are who think that politics is dirty basically then use as a route to take their favorite social cause to a court, and then you have a legal process that that kind of goes into play where essentially it's completely divorced from any democratic process whatsoever. And you essentially have a bunch of lawyers talking to a, to a judge and deciding how to adjudicate on something that's basically a highly political idea of justice. So, so for example, um, one thing that I found interesting, and, and I, was, I, was, I was talking to a few friends about this, which I learned, was that today is the day that marks the Sharpsburg ma massacre. And that for the longest time, it is the day that marks this specific massacre, which gestures to one specific event which evokes specific questions and ideas. And suddenly it becomes human rights day. Now, now human rights are child rights, human rights are rights to adequate nutrition, human rights are rights to shelter, human rights are rights to, 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 to water, but this is not about that, right? This is about a specific, specific idea of justice which has its own implications. So, so we can talk about water on like World Water Day, and we can talk about child rights on World Child Rights Day, and we can do these things, but to, to, kind of, to basically use the umbrella of human rights to kind of collapse this, essentially my, my, my kind of argument is that it, it essentially colonizes your imagination of the future. Because today, our imagination of the future 
is a future where everyone's human rights are respected. And, and while that sounds like an awesome place, I have no idea what that looks like. I don't know what that means. Uh, I don't know what we have to do to ensure that everyone's human rights are respected. I think what's more important is to actually figure out uh, specific things that need to be done. So, for instance, if we look at, say, the question of labor, right, because I'm, I'm obsessed with labor and, and a free man. So in a free man, we're, we're looking at labor, except that we're not looking at, we're not looking at miners, uh, we're not looking at factory workers, we're not looking at people whose, whose politics is shaped by a permanent job and is shaped by wage negotiations and is shaped by safety regulation. Because while all these things are really important, uh, in India, this compromises 10% of the workforce. And 90% of the workforce is today a, a cook or a waitress or someone who sells cell phone cards or someone who sells who's your gardener or somebody who basically is, is a daily wage worker like this who doesn't even have a contract. Um, and so the question is that, that, that if we, we, we can imagine, you know, a, a kind of leftist discourse of, of hammers and sickles, but, but my point is we need to imagine a, a leftist discourse of, you know, garden shears and kitchen tops. And, and I think that is where you're going to see the future of any radical movement or any radical discussion about what it means to have a future, what it means to be a, a worker, and what it means to address issues of justice. You know, I think it's, uh, I find it fascinating that, uh, that you know, uh, based on uh, your writing style, um, that you, 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 you have almost a, a very um, uh, humorous um, approach to how it is that you, you, uh, uh, you write your, your, your stories. And yet, at the core of them um, uh, are, these, are, these, are these fundamental truths. Now, uh, here's um, uh, this other question. Uh, it has to do with, with, with truth. A lot of people who have gone to journalism school uh, and have studied journalism, when you ask them, why did you study journalism, right, uh, have, have come back to me and said, well, you know, actually, the thing about it is I, I wanted to learn how to, to write. And a perfect example, uh, in, 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 in this country, someone who uh, until recently was writing a, a, a column for the Sunday Times, Fred Kuman, who I, I have said, because he's, he's a friend of mine, I said, Thank God they fired you because now you will um, manage to find time to do what I think you do best. And because you know, having read uh, his fiction, uh, Bridges Brew being a case in point, uh, is, is he really is a guy who's supposed to be to be writing uh, fiction, who's, write, who's supposed to be writing uh, books. Here's this: it's a question that any journalism 101 student, uh, uh, you know, will, 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 get, will, be, will get asked is truth, whatever your version of what truth is, Jackie, do you find more truth uh, in your fiction writing, in your art, when you are expressing uh, yourself and you are writing and you are building characters? Are you more truthful than when it is that you are writing a hardcore uh, article where you are just supposed, it's supposed to be reported, you are just reporting? completely unfair question, which is why I'm asking it. Um, I would say that the beauty of fiction is you can actually like tackle big issues, okay, you can tackle uncomfortable subjects under the guise of fiction writing yeah. and help to save that debate while in the journalism part, if you, you know, yes, of course, like you go out and save the truth and, you know, you write your article, but sometimes it actually puts you in danger. Um, because I remember l last year I was blogging for Foreign Policy Magazine of the U.S. And, you know, it's I, you know, and so I was the voice about Uganda and all of that. And it just happened that last, well, I guess it happens when your leaders stay in power for too long. Different things tend, tend to happen. They become the people that you know they had, you know they they had hated. And like in Uganda, um, um, I I mean for those of you that have followed the international media, the police has been coming down on the opposition in the country. And so there was a case when young 
when university students came up with a book, it was called The Fundamental Change because when the president of my country, apparently when he was a young guy and the reason that he in Uganda when you know you form a rebel group, we refer to it as going to the bush. So like, you know, and so the reason why he went to the bush was, you know, to like, you know, fight the tribalism in the country, lack of equal distribution of resources and all those different things. And so they had the 10 point program, you know, sorry, they had that 10 point, yes, yeah, that 10 point program, the reason as to why they went to the bush. And so these young university students put a book and they were just like analyzing. This is what you said back, you know, in the early 80s when you came into power. But now when we look, this is um, 2012, and, you know, so there was nothing new that they were saying and no national secrets or whatever it is, you know, like it was in the open domain and the police came down hard. So I wrote a blog about it and then the local media picked it up, but in the, you know, and, and this particular media house has very strong links with um, the security organs in the country and you know it's the way they put it in the paper and the response and all of that you know like it was this kind of okay well I mean like we are watching you our eyes are on you and suddenly I got these funny requests on Facebook and Twitter like you know I think our se security officers are very juvenile or naive or whatever it is like you know you bring out an article which they don't like and suddenly they want to friend you to, to follow what it is discussions are so like at times you know like truth might put you like you know you you know like um well of course it's important to write the truth but at times you know um it it may put you in harm's way and after that article i kind of like went a little bit you know like come and did all the other nice things because we all talk about africa is rising and all the good things about uganda that take you know logical stuff and all of that you know you, you know just to balance that out yeah but if I had put that in a work of fiction, you know, like, um, okay, well, even the, well, most people don't really read that 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 much. I think you, you know, so like, probably that would have helped me, yeah. But you know, so like, that is what you face. But at the time you said, you know, like, mm. this really needs to come out in the realistic form of journalism, and and you're going to go with it, mm. and then at times in fiction. Um, then at times there are some issues that you'll handle in fiction because like I'll give an example um, 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 we, we all know the issue in Uganda you know we have tabled the anti-homosexuality bill many times and I like to tell people it's not like we are moving around with machetes trying you know to like kill gays and stuff I always correct them and say you, you know what this bill is just is 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 being used as a distraction because when you, you follow the times it has been tabled you know in in the parliament there are very big corruption scandals that have taken place you know you know and so it, it just happens at around that time and recently i cracked a joke saying oh like you know in, and um, um um like the um oil companies are you know you know it's they supposedly bribed our president and now it's a big story and i was like one of these days we're going to have that anti-homosexuality bill again you know like being tabled you know to to like you know take you know the whole attention from it but uh, you know it's from from um the corruption cases but now there have been stories by ugandan writers that have dealt with issues of homosexuality but they have been in works of fiction and so there has has not been an afro like oh you're recruiting our children you're spoiling it's an african so like at times you know fiction can work as a perfect tool mm. to to start getting these issues out you know and i like um what jude said you know d during his discussion because mm. one of his books it you know it deals with homosexuality in nigeria and you know how it has been his best-selling book you know so people can actually go and buy a book and say no you see i, I just want to read it's a work of fiction so so yeah, i it, guess yes yeah. in that way like you know you know it's that truth you know can be used in 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 fiction all right uh i'm pretty certain you have uh uh questions uh and you'd like uh, to uh engage with uh, with uh, with aman uh and and uh, and jackie 
Um, where are our mics? Uh, over there, okay. Uh, questions. This is now uh, an opportunity. I think we have one here. Down here. And in the meantime, if anyone also has another question, they just hand up and then I can. Um, throughout your whole history of writing, have you ever came across rejection? And if you have, um, how did you overcome that rejection? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm, I'm being facetious. No, I, I've had a lot of uh, uh, non-fiction turned down. Uh, but that, those, are, those have been kind of proposals for... Uh, I mean, you basically you find a story, you find a breaking story, you, you pitch it to an editor and be like, I think this is an awesome story. And, and they think that this is an idiotic idea. And so you say, okay. <laughs> and then when something else happens, you just say, this is an awesome story. And, and sometimes they say, yeah, okay, okay, cool. You know. And I think that... that uh, over a period of time, they start judging your uh, sense of news. So, so once they learn to trust you, uh, then they probably figure that, you know, well, the last time you said it was an awesome story, it was an average story. Because they'll never say that you, you were right. So, so then over a period of time, I think you just, you just, yeah, I guess just, you know, once you fail, you try, try, try again, I suppose. All right, I think we, uh, did you want to take it, take the road? Have you ever been rejected? <laughs> Personally, on the other hand. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have, we have, yeah, okay. Okay, right there, yeah. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I would like to thank this opportunity. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, the first discussion earlier on of the two writers. It was so very good, so very wonderful. And I would like to encourage uh, Mr. Damon. Uh, his voice is so very great, so very attractiveness. <laughs> you know, uh, I wanted to ask him a question earlier before. Unfortunately, I didn't get the time. But I would like to encourage you and, and also uh, give you a mind up, maybe, have you ever thought about writing a movie uh, using your voice that is so very attractiveness, <laughs> that is so very wonderful? Don't laugh, people. Okay. Uh, let me go for uh, this discussion. I would like to go for uh, Miss or Mrs. J.K. Patanda. Miss. Miss, thank you. Okay. Uh, I heard your voice in different levels. Actually, your tone wasn't the same while you were reading the, the book. I want to know what's happening there. Please, can you ask me? Do you want to take this question, or do you, Damon? Do you want to? Do, no, okay. No, 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 no. All right. I was just checking. Um. Okay, to the gentleman who asked and went around and I said, "This is our time. Like, don't ask Damon questions." Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, when you read stories, it is also about engaging the audience. So you have different tones because you know it's this story has issues of fear and all of those kind of things. So that was the reason I was reading, to dramatize it. So it is a pity that this came as a question. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Anyone have any real questions? Can, can we take, uh, take it directly to us? Yeah. <laughs> Demons could be at the bar. Right. <laughs> we, <laughs> we've got another, another question. Hopefully not about Damon. OK. <laughs> Please. Um, this question is directed to um, Aman. Um, Aman, how did you know to make the transition from your previous career to journalism, and um, when did you know that it was actually the right timing for you? Well, uh, I actually knew pretty early because I, I never my my career as a chemist was fairly stillborn. Um, <laughs> I I started I 
basically, I by by the end of my first year, uh, it was painfully apparent uh, to to me and and those I trusted and loved and my professors that perhaps this was not what I should be doing. Um, and then in, in 2002, uh, just as I was finishing first year and I was thinking of things to do, uh, there was this communal riot in, in the state of Gujarat where uh, the government was fairly, I mean, this is a, a sub judas but the, the sense was that the government had, had played a significant, well, if, if not a crime of commission, then definitely a crime of omission in letting this riot uh, reach uh, the fever pitch that it did. So, so I went and I worked in a riot relief camp. And uh, when I came back from that drive and relief camp, I, uh, I think I came back fairly kind of traumatized because I had never seen this kind of, kind of brutality or violence before. And I ended up writing about it. And I ended up writing a report. And the report, uh, in the act of writing, I actually found that A, I had managed to process uh, the, the, the experience that I had had. Uh, and B, that this was something that I really wanted to do, uh, which was to... To, to, to kind of write about um, to write about to write about you know the way that the state kind of oppresses those that it's supposed to rule yeah so that's how I decided to become a writer and then I mean a journalist and and a free man basically arose out of my journalism so it began as a as a magazine story and then I just kind of stuck with it because I found such interesting people so yeah okay uh, our last question unless there is Pressing it, okay. There's okay. Please go for it. So my question pertains to the idea of human rights. Um, I mean, as you know, this was born out of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's co-authored by Stefan Hassel, and um, for the purpose of providing a legal framework to um, protect humanity from uh, from crimes. Um, and so, in, in saying that you think that human rights is bullshit, I mean, are you thinking? Are you are you saying that like such a document really has no use or it shouldn't shouldn't exist? Because I mean that that you know that concerns me actually because you know from this document, all kinds of human rights organizations have arisen, like Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, who do tremendous work. Um, there are a lot of problems with it, of course, because it's not. Um, applied equitably, but so I, I'd like you to comment on that. Please. Yeah. So my point on, on my my point on the rights discourse is that I think that the rights discourse is completely exhausted from the inside out, uh, and that as you pointed out, it's it's a legal framework which uh, it's a legal framework that's attempting to operate in a space where essentially every illegal act is treated as an act of exception, and is very rarely actually implemented. So I suppose at one level it, it gives you a broad direction in which one can move. But at the same time, as, as a text itself, I, I fail to see what possibilities it actually has. Uh, because I think that, that even without the framework of, of uh, 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 without a legal framework, there are ways of evolving political frameworks uh, which are far more democratic, uh, which actually allow you to build genuine movements. Uh, around 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 specific causes, and and I feel, and I and I understand where you're coming from because I of course sat in on your presentation yesterday, um, but at the same time as we know, um, these certain kinds of people don't have human rights. Uh, that 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 if you, for instance, one of the zone, one of the drone doctrines is that a militant uh, who doesn't have human rights, uh, a militant according to the U.S. drone uh, doctrine is a young man of military age in a designated military zone. So, so what I'm saying is that, that, that the framework as a legal framework has, is a nice document, but I feel that it stymies genuine political engagement with things because things automatically are quickly treated as human rights cases and then show up in a legal court framework. And then everyone kind of turns around and says, we must not politicize this, we must let the law take its course, except that the law never takes its course. So, so on the one hand, you effectively cut away any kind of political engagement with the space because we cannot politicize this and we must not score political points on this. We must stick to the letter of the law. Yet at the same time, the game is gerrymandered to a point where, where you're essentially left kind of waiting for, for lawyers with feelings who don't take fees. So, so yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, 
We have, we've got someone there with them. I mean, feel free to use the word. Uh, the word yes, the, la the question I was going to ask has, was to ask Alan um, to enlarge and explain what he meant that there were no uh, human rights and the question that was just asked him and he answered did broaden his answer because my question to you was going to be are there any human rights for humans? I mean, I don't know. I mean, what, what, what are we hoping for in the sense of there are, there are well-established uh, doctrines of justice uh, that existed prior to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, and I think that, that through political language one can evolve uh, patterns of behavior because the human rights doctrine basically is things like you should not commit genocide. Well, yeah, okay. I mean, we knew that. So, so that, that, that's my way of looking at it. That, that the, the declaration has not explained to me anything I did not know. It did not in any way give me uh, a framework I can actually use to bring people. I, I mean, I can, I can bring out reports where I can decry the failure to respect human rights. Uh, but beyond decrying failure to respect, I, I have been unable to find something that that gives me either a theoretical tool or a political tool or, or an actionable form to enter this space. Okay. All right. Um, no, we. I'm getting very vigorous. Uh, um, uh, no, no, no. We have uh, run out of time. Uh, Aman is uh, is still around, and if you if you'd like just uh, to ask him questions, and, and also uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, both uh, to Jackie Patanda and uh, our Aman. You said that please. Uh, Give them uh, yet another round. Of I'm sorry.